Welcome everyone uh, to the New Testament survey class. Um, if someone could please open us in prayer and then we'll get into our content for today. Shall I go on, Sister? Yes, please. Thank you. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you, Father God, for this blessed time in our lives, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, as we learn your word, let your word get deep rooted in us, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, let it be retained and restored in our lives to bear the fruits of your word, being blessing to others, being blessing to each other in our lives, oh Lord Jesus. We commit this time into your precious hands, and we also submit each and every one of us into your hands and our faculties into your hands, Lord Jesus, to, play, to bless this hour and grow in, our, grow in your word richly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, um, Let's just uh, do a quick recap of what we covered um, in our last class, last Monday, and then we'll uh, go into today's, um, what we're going to cover today. So last week we started, uh, we just had an introduction to the gospel accounts. Uh, so we looked at the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're called the synoptic gospels because uh, they all um, have the content between these three books is all very similar. Uh, it's thought by most scholars that Mark was uh, first written, and then Matthew and Luke used Mark's account to write their own books. Uh, so that is why we see about uh, over 90% of Mark is in Matthew and Luke. Uh, so um, these three Gospels have uh, very similar uh, kind of stories uh, about what Jesus did and some of his teachings, whereas John uh, has a very, very different take on the life of Jesus. And so John, the book of John is not included in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, we looked at why we have four gospel accounts, um, that each of them was written for a different audience with a different focus, with a different pers perspective and a different purpose uh, for writing. And so um, each of these gospel writers uh, together give us uh, a very, uh, I guess, uh, a more holistic view of Jesus's life, right? Uh, rather than being written by one person to have four different people uh, talking about different aspects of why Jesus came and about his life and ministry um, helps us to get a fuller understanding of the gospel. Um, we also looked at the fact that they had, there have been several attempts to put all of these four Gospels into a single Gospel, but uh, it hasn't worked out well because each of them has such a different theme, such a different way of writing, uh, that uh, something is lost when we try and put them all together. And Matthew talks about Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, Mark as the suffering Son of God, Luke as the Savior for all people, John as the eternal Son of God. Uh, and so each of them has their own specific um, focus in their writing and their presentation of Jesus. Um, so the other question is then, why are there only four gospel accounts? Why don't we have more? Uh, we looked at some of the ways in which the gospels were chosen and as well as other books in the New Testament. Uh, they were chosen based on their uh, reliability, the historical reliability, that is when it was written, who wrote it, and whether what was written was in agreement with other records about Jesus's life that were existing at that time. Uh, 
uh, we uh, it also one of the things was whether it carried spiritual power and authority, uh, whether the content in the books carried spiritual power and authority. And the last one was orthodoxy. That is, did it agree with Christian uh, Christian doctrine, uh, with what the church was teaching as true, or was it coming from one of the heretical groups uh, which had been rejected by the church? And so if uh, the theology didn't align with what was viewed as um, right doctrine by the church, those books were not included uh, in the Gospels and in the New Testament. Uh, so we looked at the difference between the meaning of the word gospel and the gospel. So there is a single gospel uh, which proclaims salvation through Jesus's, uh, Jesus's death and resurrection. Uh, that is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's also called, uh, we saw a list of different ways in which it's referred to as gospel of grace, gospel of Christ, gospel of the kingdom. Uh, gospel of salvation, gospel of peace. Um, and that is different from gospels, which is the four different books that talk about the one gospel. So the gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, they all talk about this gospel of Jesus Christ uh, that is that proclaims salvation to the world. Um, we also started to look at the background to the book of Matthew, uh, right? So uh, the Old Testament was pointing to a Messiah who would come and redeem Israel. And between the Old Testament times and the New Testament times, there was an increased um, uh, anticipation, increased uh, sense of the Messiah's coming during this time of waiting. Uh, and uh, some of the expectations were that this the Messiah would be a political uh, deliverer who would uh, free the Jews from foreign rule, uh, would uh, rule from Jerusalem and rule across the whole world, um, and would also reclaim the temple, uh, taking it and establishing uh, the true worship of Yahweh in the temple once again. Um, some of the characteristics of the Gospel of Matthew is that it's uh, written uh, um, with very short, not a lot of uh, additional words, not a lot of additional uh, descriptions like Mark. Uh, if you compare some of the stories between Matthew and Mark, Matthew will have a very short account with some of the main points, whereas Mark may have more details about the people, the things that happened uh, in that story uh, than, Ma than Matthew will include. Um, Matthew is very, very focused on the Messiah as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So he uh, will see a lot in Matthew about uh, this happened to fulfill this scripture in the uh, this scripture, and so it will point to some scripture from the Hebrew scriptures, which is our Old Testament. Uh, so he was pointing to the fact that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies and fulfilled the Old Testament, uh, what the Old Testament promised and talked about, which was the coming Messiah. Um, Matthew is also uh, particularly focused on Jewish Christians. So uh, we see a lot of reference to uh, Jewish tradition, Hebrew scriptures, things that only Jews would be familiar with. But at the same time, uh, he also continues to keep the Gentiles very much in the picture. Uh, so we see accounts of um, Gentiles at Jesus. Part of Jesus's lineage, um, uh, we uh, see the Great Commission calling uh, Jesus' disciples to go to all nations. So Matthew doesn't forget uh, that the gospel is for the Gentiles, uh, but at the same time, his audience is 
the Jewish Christians. And so uh, a lot of his content uh, will be very uh, relevant to them. Um, then we looked at the ecclesiastical elements. So uh, the fact that only Matthew talks about the church and uh, how it is that the church is mentioned so early on uh, by Jesus himself. Right? Before the church actually came into existence, uh, we see in Matthew that Jesus talks about the church. Um, and then the last thing is the eschatological interest. So uh, when we say eschatology, we're talking about uh, things related to uh, death, to our judgment, to our final destiny. Uh, that is when we will uh, receive either the reward of being in the presence of God, or we will go to uh, go to a place of eternal separation from God. So either heaven or hell. Uh, so Matthew uh, actually has a great of, um, mention of eschatology than the other gospels. So the whole of chapters 24 and 25 talks about the end times. Uh, and we also see a few parables where it's talking about the judgment of people uh, and being sent into eternal um, into, uh, eternal separation from God. Uh, so that is what we covered till last week's class. Uh, and now we'll move into uh, a few things about the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, so firstly, uh, who is the author of the book of Matthew? Um, in the book itself, in the gospel itself, there's no mention of the author. So from Matthew, we can't tell who the author is. But uh, traditionally, that is, um, the early church uh, attributed this book to the disciple Matthew. Uh, so this is what we continue to uh, follow according to the early church's tradition. Uh, we continue to... Uh, say that this book was written by Matthew. Um, we are uh, just taking the fact that if they said that it was written by Matthew, it was for a reason that they believed that it was done by him. Uh, so some things that we know about Matthew is that he was also called Levi. Uh, if someone can read Mark 2.14 for us. Mark 2.14, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Thank you. So here we see the calling of Matthew, and um, he is also called Levi, All right? Um, if someone can read um, Mark 9.9 9 for us, please. Sorry, Matthew 9 9. As he, as Gospel he of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Thank you. Um, and so we see here again in Matthew 10, 3, uh, that Matthew is named as one of the disciples and uh, he is Matthew the tax collector. So uh, some of the things from uh, these gospels that we know about Ma uh, Matthew is that he was also known as Levi, uh, which... Uh, uh, may refer, may also indicate that he was a Levite, uh, which would make it all the more um, surprising that he was a tax collector. Also, would have been something that he was despised for because he was a Levite who had uh, then sided with the Romans in the fact that he became a tax collector. Um, 
And of course, we know that as a tax collector, he was rejected uh, by the Jewish people. He was excluded from the community. Uh, he was viewed as a traitor. Uh, and, um, and so he was someone who was not uh, really welcome. Right, uh, but here Jesus goes up to him and Jesus uh, calls him right from his tax collector uh, collection booth, and uh, probably one of the few welcomes that he's received from the Jewish community, and he responds to that call and follows Jesus. Um, so some of the things that we see, uh, some of the ways in which we see his uh, skills or his particular uh, characteristics as a tax collector play a role in the way he writes the gospel is that he has an interest in some of the monetary uh, things that happen in the life of Jesus or some of the parables that Jesus told that other books, other gospels don't uh, include. So the parable of the unmerciful servant, uh, which talks about returning a debt, um, right? Um, that is something that only Matthew uh, talks about. And the workers in the vineyard um, in uh, Matthew chapter 20 is also something that only he talks about. Uh, the fact that Jesus betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver is only something that he records. And uh, talking about um, the bribe that the priests give to the guards at Jesus's tomb uh, is only mentioned by Matthew. So we see his um, interest in money or his uh, inclination towards monetary um, accounts being uh, playing a role in the way he writes the book. Um, in addition to that, he would have been quite highly educated compared to the other disciples as a tax collector, and he would have been skilled in taking notes and maintaining accounts. So those are some things that uh, would definitely um, have influenced the way he's written the book, even uh, in the genealogy, if we look at Matthew 117, he actually <clears throat> mentions like a numerical way in which he's arranged the genealogy. So he says, uh, all those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. So uh, we see his interest in numbers coming through here. <clears throat> um, so. Who were the, uh, so we covered who the author was. Uh, so who was he writing to? Uh, we see uh, within Matthew itself about 60 references to Jewish prophecies that were fulfilled. Uh, in this image here is a few examples. Uh, so the virgin birth um, in Matthew 123, uh, he says, uh, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophets. So that is Matthew 122. And then he quotes from Isaiah um, about the virgin birth. And then we see Matthew 2, 6, where uh, the wise men come searching for the king of the Jews. Um, and uh, King Herod asked the scribes uh, to look for uh, to tell him where the Messiah is supposed to be born. And they quote from Micah 5 to saying that he would come from Bethlehem. Uh, Matthew 2 15 talking about uh, the Old Testament uh, passage saying uh, God brought his son out of Egypt. So uh, saying that that was a reference to Jesus when Jesus returns from Egypt uh, once King Herod has died. Um, so different passages like that we see uh, where Matthew is specifically pointing to the fact that Jesus's life fulfilled some of the prophecies from the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and um, that points to the fact that he was he was uh, kind of strengthening their faith in the fact that Jesus truly was the Messiah uh, who uh, was promised in the Old Testament, who was promised in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, 
And then if someone can read Matthew 10, 5 and Matthew 15, 24, uh, we'll just look at some of the other things that Matthew talks about. Matthew 10, 5. Matthew 10, 5. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go now where among the Gentiles and entered no town of the Samaritans. Uh, you can just go into verse 6 as well. And 7. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thank you. And Matthew 15, 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Thank you. So uh, we see here Matthew uh, specifically highlighting Jesus' uh, mission or ministry to the people of Israel. Um, again, because of his focus on the Jewish Christians. Um, so why did he write the book? To encourage Jewish Christians. Uh, so um, the the Jewish uh, Christians obviously uh, were uh, people who were uh, facing persecution from the Jews, right? Because uh, they had left their Jewish faith and had followed uh, Jesus, who was viewed as someone who had blasphemed God, who uh, was a false uh, teacher, who was a false messiah. But these Jews had uh, believed in him and left uh, their their families or their tradition and begun to follow this uh, person named Jesus. And so Matthew writes to affirm to them that what you have uh, chosen is true. It is uh, of God. It is a true fulfillment of God's promises. Um, he also, at the same time, uh, talks about judgment about on the Jewish establishment. So uh, if someone can read Matthew 24, 1 and 2. Matthew 24, 1. Then uh, Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, assuredly I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Thank you. So um, we see here, uh, while Jesus is encouraging, um, while uh, Matthew is encouraging these Jews who have uh, come to faith in Jesus, he's also talking about the judgment that is going to come upon uh, the that was the Jewish rulers and leaders of that day and the temple, uh, that the temple itself in the process would be uh, destroyed. Uh, we see that in Matthew 24. Uh, at the same time, he also talks about this future new kingdom that is going to be uh, established. We see that in uh, chapters 24 and 25. Uh, and he ends with this uh, promise, with this hope that even in this present time, um, Jesus is with them until that kingdom is realized. Um, so surely I'm with you even to the end of the age. Um, the focus on God with us, Emmanuel. Uh, so some of the key words we see in Matthew are kingdom, fulfilled kingdom of heaven. So Matthew, um, like we talked about, is very focused on Jesus as the king of the Jews. And so he, his language is very much kingdom oriented. So kingdom, kingdom of heaven. And then the other aspect of Jesus fulfilling the, um, the Hebrew scriptures. And so we'll see fulfilled, uh, this happened to fulfill the Old Testament. Uh, this happened to fulfill the scriptures that say this. And so Matthew will use a lot of that language as well. Uh, the date of writing. Uh, now, um, in your uh, in your notes, it says uh, I think fifty to sixty A.D., uh, but you can just correct that. Uh, so many scholars think it was sometime 
it could be a wide range before 72 even up to 90 AD uh, but usually it's not dated before 64 AD which is when uh, people think that uh, the scholars think that Mark was written so because Matthew is based on the book of Mark um, it it's usually dated to after 64 AD uh, and sometime uh, sometime after that till about 90 AD so some uh, some of them think that it happened before the destruction of the temple and some others uh, think it happened after the destruction of the temple which was in 70 AD um, there is a wide range of views on that uh, but usually later than 64 AD um so the gospel of matthew uh is laid out in a very uh very organized way which is also why uh people attribute that to the fact that matthew who was a tax collector was uh, trained to make notes and to have uh make detailed records um some people also liken the Gospel of Matthew to the Pentateuch. Uh, so the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, and they say that uh, Matthew was presented as the new Moses and the greater Moses, whereas uh, Moses in the Old Testament came to proclaim this uh, he he was used by god uh, to establish the covenant with the people of israel jesus himself uh, establishes a new covenant uh, with with all those who will believe in him and so um, jesus is a new and greater moses uh, so if we look at the gospel of matthew uh, the first two chapters are um, sort of an introduction to who Jesus is. So chapter one has a genealogy. Chapter two has stories about the birth of Jesus. Um, then uh, in the gospel, we have five discourses. This is what is compared with the Pentateuch. Um, so the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five to seven. Uh, Jesus sending out the 12, chapter 10. Uh, parables about the kingdom in chapter 13 greatness in the kingdom uh, in chapters 18 and then 19 and 20 and uh, i'll talk a little bit about why this division is there so chapters 18 and then 19 and 20 are separate and then judgment and the coming kingdom from chapters 23 to 25. so um each of these at the end of each of these chapters uh, you usually see something that says when Jesus had finished saying these things or when Jesus had finished teaching the disciples and then it goes into the next part. So almost to mark the end of that sermon uh, or the teaching that Jesus was giving. So we see that at the end of chapter 18 uh, in chapter 19, verse one, that's why we have this division here. Um, chapter 19 verse 1 says when Jesus had finished saying these things and then he travels uh, from uh, where he is to uh, Galilee let me just open that up so it says when Jesus had finished saying these things he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea east of the Jordan River so he leaves Galilee goes to Judea and then the teaching continues uh, in chapters 19 and 20 so that's why there's that division uh, and then the end is the epilogue, uh, which also includes the Great Commission. So that's a larger structural overview of the book of Matthew. Um, so some of the distinctive features um, is that what we mentioned earlier, it's the only gospel containing the word church or ecclesia. Uh, Matthew records these five sermons by Jesus. Now, uh, in so those five great sermons that people uh, mention, uh, it's sometimes different. So some people, um, this is one of the views that 
this is one of the sermons, and then 24, 25 is another sermon. And then they don't include what we looked at, which is greatness in the kingdom, uh, chapters 18, 19, and 20. Um, but um, many people do see it as divided into five sermons. Um, Matthew also, uh, he divides his book, not chronologically. So when he's recording the life of Jesus, he's not doing it uh, as per Jesus's day-to-day uh, -day life, or recording it in that same timeline. Rather, he groups it according to topics. So he, uh, he groups it according to his discourses, according to his parables, according to his miracles. And that's how he records Jesus's life and ministry. And uh, as we looked at earlier also, that Matthew is very interested in eschatology, so uh, final rewards and punishments. And so there's a lot of use of words like judgment, hell, fire, uh, and then judgment specifically on the Jewish leaders, so uh, the woes on the Jewish, uh, on the Pharisees, and uh, yeah, use of the word hypocrite. Uh, we see all of that in the book of Matthew. So if we compare the book of Matthew with a few other biblical books, we see that Matthew uh, presents Jesus as king, whereas Mark presents Jesus as a servant, um, as, as the son of God who came as a servant. And Matthew, uh, he talks about Jesus' resurrection, whereas Luke talks about Jesus' acceptance, uh, Jesus uh, of people coming to faith in Jesus. Uh, Matthew and Mark talk of Jesus, uh, the cru crucifixion as um, something where Jesus was a victim, whereas Luke and John talk about Jesus as a victor. Uh, and Matthew 24 explains uh, the seal judgments that are mentioned in Revelation 6 to 1. So uh, we can see that connection between Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation. Um, now, um, there are different ways in which the book of Matthew or the Gospel of Matthew is looked at. Uh, some people will see uh, the Gospel of Matthew as very focused on the kingdom. Uh, and so they'll divide the book of Matthew according to those themes, how Matthew presents the kingdom of heaven. Um, this, this outline of Matthew is uh, looking at how Matthew presents Christ as king, or as Jesus as king. And so the whole gospel, the outline that's given, is uh, showing how Jesus' kingship is uh, presented, how people respond to Jesus' kingship, um, and uh, how uh, all of that plays, out, plays a role in the way he presents Jesus' life throughout the gospel. Uh, so we'll just quickly go through this outline and I also request you to keep your Bibles open um, so that anytime we need to refer to scriptures as we're looking at the outline, we can do that. Um, so we begin um, Matthew with a genealogy of uh, Jesus. Um, this presents uh, Jesus um, as uh, Jesus in the lineage of David. So as the promised Messiah who comes uh, in the line of David and so ends with uh, Joseph being the father of Jesus. And um, then we have the birth of Jesus in uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. We have the visit of the wise men. We have Jesus, uh, so uh, Joseph taking the family to Egypt, um, Herod killing the children. Um, uh, this is where uh, we see also that um, comparison between Moses and Jesus, right? So when Moses was born, uh, the uh, Jewish children are killed, or the Hebrew children are killed. Uh, and at this even here in this story, we see when Jesus is born that um, all of the Jewish sons uh, below the age of two are killed. So we see that 
um, similarity in the record that Matthew is giving. And then Jesus returns to Nazareth from Egypt. So this is uh, looked at as the advent of the king. And then the next section is where uh, Jesus is being uh, Jesus is being presented to the people and by John the Baptist. So um, we have an introduction to John the Baptist, and then we have a little uh, summary of John the Baptist's message. Um, and then the next part is the approval of the king. And this approval of the king uh, comes from God the Father himself. It's not from the people. So we see in the baptism of Jesus um, in chapter 3, where the voice from heaven says, chapter 3, verse 17, a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. So um, the father himself uh, presents Jesus as his son and uh, affirms who he is and his ministry uh, that is about to begin. And then we see uh, Jesus' temptation uh, and his um, ability to remain free from sin, even in the face of temptation. Uh, from chapter 4 onwards, we see uh, Jesus being proclaimed as the king. Uh, chapter 4, verse 12 to 729. Uh, we first have a little um, introduction to Jesus' ministry, his calling of his disciples, and uh, some of the uh, healings that happen. So in verses 23 to 25, we see in Galilee um, that Jesus is teaching in the synagogues. He's announcing about the kingdom of God and he's healing people. Uh, and uh, there are crowds of people who are following him and starting uh, to experience his miracles and witness his ministry. Uh, and yes, yeah, so this is Jesus ministering in Galilee. And then we go into the first uh, discourse, the first sermon, which is the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus teaches on various topics uh, on the kingdom, on Jesus himself uh, in relationship to the Old Testament scriptures, to the Hebrew scriptures, uh, on Jesus teaching about entering God's kingdom. And then uh, it ends with the response of people to his sermon. Uh, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he thought he taught with real authority, uh, quite unlike their religious teachers. Okay, so I'm sorry, this is a lot of content, but uh, please do keep your Bibles open also, so that we are uh, also keeping in line with the scripture, not just uh, looking at all of these uh, outlines. Um, apart from the scripture, yeah. So uh, chapters 8 to 11 uh, talks about the power of Jesus as king. And so we see demonstrations of uh, Jesus' power through healing, uh, through uh, calling of disciples. So in <clears throat> verses 18 to 22, Jesus talks about the cost of discipleship, right? Um, so if someone can just uh, tell us, uh, I'm hoping everyone has their Bibles open, what is it that Jesus says in these verses 8, 18 to 22? What does he say is the cost of following him? to follow him now, not to wait until a certain time in the future, but uh, to uh, that uh, true disciple will 
sacrifice everything and make that decision to give up all things for the sake of Christ. Um, then he goes into, uh, then the book goes into uh, miracles of power. Uh, what are some miracles we see here? We see Jesus calming the storm. We see him uh, healing the um, two demon-possessed men. Um, so uh, this is where he sends the um, the demons into the herd of pigs. Uh, we see Jesus healing a paralyzed man, right? And then uh, we see uh, Jesus also calling the disciples in between. So we see uh, Matthew is called in Matthew 9.9. Uh, so there, there is a little description of what are some of the uh, distinctions of being a disciple. Uh, we see uh, Jesus saying, uh, it's not healthy people that need a doctor, it's sick people. So people who really recognize that they need a savior are the ones who will uh, follow him. And this is in response to uh, the Pharisees um, questioning Jesus uh, because Matthew is among his disciples. Um, we also see this question on fasting, why are the disciples not fasting? So all of that is addressed here. And then we see miracles uh, of a restoration. Uh, this is uh, the woman with the issue of blood, uh, of uh, Jesus healing the blind. Uh, so all of that included here in Revelation of uh, Jesus and his power uh, in relation to him being king. And then uh, in this next section, we see delegation of power. Uh, so this is where Jesus sends out the 12 disciples uh, to minister. And uh, he gives them instructions about how they are to go out and how they are to minister to people. With that we come uh, to the next section. So this was uh, proclaiming the power of the king, Matthew proclaiming the power of the king. And this is uh, starting to look at his rejection, Jesus's rejection as king. Uh, so starting from chapter 11, we see uh, first that John the Baptist uh, is uh, is put in prison, right? And uh, John himself starts to question, is Jesus the true Messiah that they had been waiting for? Um, then uh, we see that uh, Jesus talks about him being rejected by that generation of people uh, in verses 16 to 19 of chapter 11. Then uh, Jesus talks about uh, the people of Capernaum, of Bethsaida and Chorazin who have rejected him. Uh, and it, this ends with an invitation to all of them to come to Jesus. Uh, can somebody read that for us? Matthew 11, 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus was declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed to them to little children. Yes, such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. You can go on to verse 13. Okay. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you. So uh, we see uh, after all of those 
uh, rejections uh, where John the Baptist, uh, that generation, and then um, the few uh, cities that Jesus mentions, uh, he makes this invitation uh, for all people to come to him, all people who recognize uh, that they are carrying burdens and they need somebody uh, to help them. <clears throat> At the same time, he also says that uh, this is something that is revealed by the Father. He himself uh, can only be known if the Father reveals him uh, to people. And uh, the Father has chosen to reveal himself to the childlike, not to those who think themselves wise and clever. And we saw that previously as well when, um, when Jesus was being questioned for having uh, Matthew amongst his disciples, where Jesus says it's only the sick who need a doctor. So if you don't recognize that you are sick, then you won't recognize that you need somebody to heal you. You don't won't recognize that you need a savior. Um, <clears throat> I saw a hand raised. Uh, was that to read the passage, or did you have a question? I think it was Sabita who had her hand raised. OK, uh, I think we've come to the end of our time. So what we'll do is uh, on Thursday, we'll continue from where we uh, stopped here at. OK, no problem, Savita. Uh, so we stopped here at the end of Matthew 11. We'll continue from Matthew 12 on Thursday. Thank you all. And Thursday's class will also be online. Uh, so for the on-campus students, uh, please join online. Thank you. Thank you very much, sister. Thank you.